Section 36 of Bullfinch's Mythology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch Chapter 36 Modern Monsters, The Phoenix, Basilisk, Unicorn, Salamander Modern Monsters There is a set of imaginary beings which seem to have been the successors of the Gorgons, Hydras, and Chimeras Dyer of the old superstitions, and, having no connection with the false gods of paganism, to have continued to enjoy an existence in the popular belief after paganism was superseded by Christianity. They are mentioned perhaps by the classical writers, but their chief popularity and currency seem to have been in more modern times. We seek our accounts of them not so much in the poetry of the ancients as in the old natural history books and narrations of travellers. The accounts which we are about to give are taken chiefly from the Penny Cyclopedia. The Phoenix Ovid tells the story of the Phoenix as follows. Most beings spring from other individuals, but there is a certain kind which reproduces itself. The Assyrians call it the Phoenix. It does not live on fruit or flowers, but on frankincense and odoriferous gums. When it has lived five hundred years, it builds itself a nest in the branches of an oak or on the top of a palm tree. In this it collects cinnamon and spikenard and myrrh, and of these materials builds a pile on which it deposits itself, and dying breathes out its last breath amidst odours. From the body of the parent bird a young phoenix issues forth, destined to live as long a life as its predecessor. When this has grown up and gained sufficient strength, it lifts its nest from the tree, its own cradle and its parent's sepulchre, and carries it to the city of Heliopolis in Egypt, and deposits it in the Temple of the Sun. Such is the account given by a poet. Now let us see that of a philosophic historian. Tacitus says, in the consulship of Paulus Fabius, A.D. 34, the miraculous bird known to the world by the name of the phoenix, after disappearing for a series of ages, revisited Egypt. It was attended in its flight by a group of various birds, all attracted by the novelty, and gazing with wonder at so beautiful an appearance. He then gives an account of the bird, not varying materially from the preceding, but adding some details. The first care of the young bird as soon as fledged, and able to trust to his wings, is to perform the obsequies of his father. But this duty is not undertaken rashly. He collects a quantity of myrrh, and to try his strength makes frequent excursions with a load on his back. When he has gained sufficient confidence in his own vigour, he takes up the body of his father and flies with it to the altar of the sun, where he leaves it to be consumed in flames of fragrance. Other writers add a few particulars. The myrrh is compacted in the form of an egg, in which the dead phoenix is enclosed. From the mouldering flesh of the dead bird a worm springs, and this worm, when grown large, is transformed into a bird. Herodotus describes the bird, though he says, I have not seen it myself, except in a picture. Part of his plumage is gold-coloured and part crimson, and he is for the most part very much like an eagle in outline and bulk. The first writer who disclaimed a belief in the existence of the phoenix was Sir Thomas Brown, in his Vulgar Errors, published in 1646. He was replied to a few years later by Alexander Ross, who says, in answer to the objection of the phoenix so seldom making his appearance, 
His instinct teaches him to keep out of the way of the tyrant of the creation, man, for if he were to be got at, some wealthy glutton would surely devour him, though there were no more in the world. Dryden, in one of his early poems, has this allusion to the phoenix. So when the new-born phoenix first is seen, her feathered subjects all adore their queen, and while she makes her progress through the east, from every grove her numerous trains increased. Each poet of the air her glory sings, and round him the pleased audience clap their wings. Milton, in Paradise Lost, Book V, compares the angel Raphael descending to earth to a phoenix. Down thither, prone in flight, he speeds, and through the vast ethereal sky sails between worlds and worlds, with steady wing, now on the polar winds, then with quick fan winnows the buxom air, till within soar of towering eagles, to all the fowls he seems a phoenix, gazed by all, as that sole bird when to enshrine his relics in the sun's bright temple, to Egyptian Thebes he flies. THE COCKATRICE OR BASILISK This animal was called the King of the Serpents, in confirmation of his royalty, he was said to be endowed with a crest or comb upon the head, constituting a crown. He was supposed to be produced from the egg of a cock hatched under toads or serpents. There were several species of this animal. One species burned up whatever they approached, a second were a kind of wandering medusa's heads, and their look caused an instant horror which was immediately followed by death. In Shakespeare's play of Richard the Third, Lady Anne, in answer to Richard's compliment on her eyes, says, Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead! The basilisks were called kings of serpents, because all other serpents and snakes, behaving like good subjects, and wisely not wishing to be burned up or struck dead, fled the moment they heard the distant hiss of their king, although they might be in full feed upon the most delicious prey, leaving the sole enjoyment of the banquet to the royal monster. The Roman naturalist Pliny thus describes him. He does not impel his body like other serpents by a multiplied flexion, but advances lofty and upright, he kills the shrubs not only by contact but by breathing on them, and splits the rocks, such power of evil is there in him. It was formerly believed that if killed by a spear from on horseback, the power of the poison conducted through the weapon killed not only the rider but the horse also. To this Lucan alludes in these lines. What though the moor the basilisk hath slain, And pinned him lifeless to the sandy plain, Up through the spear the subtle venom flies, The hand imbibes it, and the victor dies. Such a prodigy was not likely to be passed over in the legends of the saints. Accordingly we find it recorded that a certain holy man, going to a fountain in the desert, suddenly beheld a basilisk. He immediately raised his eyes to heaven, and with a pious appeal to the deity, laid the monster dead at his feet. These wonderful powers of the basilisk are attested by a host of learned persons, such as Galen, Avicenna, Scaliger, and others. Occasionally one would demur to some part of the tale while he admitted the rest. Johnston, a learned physician, sagely remarks, I would scarcely believe that it kills with its look, for who could have seen it and lived to tell the story? The worthy sage was not aware that those who went to hunt the basilisk of this sort took with them a mirror, which reflected back the deadly glare upon its author, and by a kind of poetical justice slew the basilisk with his own weapon. 
but what was to attack this terrible and unapproachable monster? There is an old saying that everything has its enemy, and the cockatrice quailed before the weasel. The basilisk might look daggers, the weasel cared not, but advanced boldly to the conflict. When bitten, the weasel retired for a moment to eat some rue, which was the only plant the basilisks could not wither, returned with renewed strength and soundness to the charge, and never left the enemy till he was stretched dead on the plain. The monster, too, as if conscious of the irregular way in which he came into the world, was supposed to have a great antipathy to a cock, and well he might, for as soon as he heard the cock crow, he expired. The basilisk was of some use after death. Thus we read that its carcass was suspended in the temple of Apollo and in private houses as a sovereign remedy against spiders, and that it was also hung up in the temple of Diana, for which reason no swallow ever dared enter the sacred place. The reader will, we apprehend, by this time have had enough of absurdities, but still we can imagine his anxiety to know what a cockatrice was like. The following is from Aldrovandus, a celebrated naturalist of the 16th century, whose work on natural history, in thirteen folio volumes, contains, with much that is valuable, a large proportion of fables and inutilities. In particular, he is so ample on the subject of the cock and the bull, that from his practice all rambling, gossiping tales of doubtful credibility are called cock and bull stories. Aldrovandus, however, deserves our respect and esteem as the founder of a botanic garden, and as a pioneer in the now prevalent custom of making scientific collections for purposes of investigation and research. Shelley, in his Ode to Naples, full of the enthusiasm excited by the intelligence of the proclamation of a constitutional government at Naples in 1820, thus uses an allusion to the basilisk. What though Cimmerian annex dare blaspheme freedom and thee? A new Actaeon's error shall theirs have been, devoured by their own hands. Be thou like the imperial basilisk, killing thy foe with unapparent wounds. Gaze on oppression till at that dread risk, aghast she pass from the earth's disk. Fear not, but gaze, for free men mightier grow, and slaves more feeble, gazing on their foe. THE UNICORN Pliny, the Roman naturalist, out of whose account of the unicorn most of the modern unicorns have been described and figured, records it as a very ferocious beast, similar in the rest of its body to a horse, with the head of a deer, the feet of an elephant, the tail of a boar, a deep bellowing voice, and a single black horn, two cubits in length, standing out in the middle of its forehead. He adds that it cannot be taken alive, and some such excuse may have been necessary in those days for not producing the living animal upon the arena of the amphitheatre. The unicorn seems to have been a sad puzzle to the hunters, who hardly knew how to come at so valuable a piece of game. Some described the horn as movable at the will of the animal, a kind of small sword, in short, with which no hunter who was not exceedingly cunning in fence could have a chance. Others maintained that all the animal's strength lay in its horn, and that when hard-pressed in pursuit, it would throw itself from the pinnacle of the highest rocks horn foremost, so as to pitch upon it, and then quietly march off, not a whit the worse for its fall. But it seems they found out how to circumvent the poor unicorn at last. They discovered that it was a great lover of purity and innocence, 
so they took the field with a young virgin, who was placed in the unsuspecting admirer's way. When the unicorn spied her, he approached with all reverence, couched beside her, and laying his head in her lap, fell asleep. The treacherous virgin then gave a signal, and the hunters made in and captured the simple beast. Modern zoologists, disgusted as they well may be with such fables as these, disbelieve generally the existence of the unicorn, yet there are animals bearing on their heads a bony protuberance more or less like a horn, which may have given rise to the story. The rhinoceros horn, as it is called, is such a protuberance, though it does not exceed a few inches in height, and is far from agreeing with the descriptions of the horn of the unicorn. The nearest approach to a horn in the middle of the forehead is exhibited in the bony protuberance on the forehead of the giraffe. But this also is short and blunt, and is not the only horn of the animal, but a third horn, standing in front of the two others. In fine, though it would be presumptuous to deny the existence of a one-horned quadruped other than the rhinoceros, it may be safely stated that the insertion of a long and solid horn in the living forehead of a horse-like or deer-like animal is as near an impossibility as anything can be. THE SALAMANDER The following is from the Life of Benvenuto Cellini, an Italian artist of the sixteenth century, written by himself. When I was about five years of age, my father, happening to be in a little room in which they had been washing, and where there was a good fire of oak burning, looked into the flames and saw a little animal resembling a lizard, which could live in the hottest part of that element. Instantly perceiving what it was, he called for my sister and me, and after he had shown us the creature, he gave me a box on the ear. I fell a-crying, while he, soothing me with caresses, spoke these words. My dear child, I do not give you that blow for any fault you have committed, but that you may recollect that the little creature you see in the fire is a salamander such a one as never was beheld before to my knowledge. So saying, he embraced me and gave me some money. It seems unreasonable to doubt a story of which Signor Cellini was both an eye and ear witness, add to which the authority of numerous sage philosophers, at the head of whom are Aristotle and Pliny, affirms this power of the salamander. According to them, the animal not only resists fire, but extinguishes it, and when he sees the flame, charges it as an enemy which he well knows how to vanquish. That the skin of an animal which could resist the action of fire should be considered proof against that element is not to be wondered at. We accordingly find that a cloth made of the skin of salamanders, for there really is such an animal, a kind of lizard, was incombustible, and very valuable for wrapping up such articles as were too precious to be entrusted to any other envelopes. These fireproof cloths were actually produced, said to be made of salamander's wool, though the knowing ones detected that the substance of which they were composed was asbestos, a mineral which is in fine filaments capable of being woven into a flexible cloth. The foundation of the above fables is supposed to be the fact that the salamander really does secrete from the pores of his body a milky juice, which, when he is irritated, is produced in considerable quantity, and would doubtless for a few moments defend the body from fire. Then it is a hibernating animal, and in winter retires to some hollow tree or other cavity, where it coils itself up, and remains in a torpid state till the spring again calls it forth. It may therefore sometimes be carried with the fuel to the fire, and wake up only time enough to put forth all its faculties for its defence. Its viscous juice would do good service, 
and all who professed to have seen it acknowledged that it got out of the fire as fast as its legs could carry it, indeed too fast for them ever to make prize of one, except in one instance, and in that one the animal's feet and some parts of its body were badly burned. Dr. Young, in the Night Thoughts, with more quaintness than good taste, compares the sceptic who can remain unmoved in the contemplation of the starry heavens to a salamander unwarmed in the fire. An undevout astronomer is mad. Oh, what a genius must inform the skies! And is Lorenzo's salamander heart cold and untouched amid these sacred fires? End of chapter 36 Recording by Graham Redman Recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable, by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 37. Eastern Mythology, Zoroaster, Hindu Mythology, Castes, Buddha, The Grand Lama, Prester John. Zoroaster. Our knowledge of the religion of the ancient Persians is principally derived from the Zendavesta, or sacred books of that people. Zoroaster was the founder of their religion, or rather the reformer of the religion which preceded him. The time when he lived is doubtful, but it is certain that his system became the dominant religion of Western Asia from the time of Cyrus, 550 BC, to the conquest of Persia by Alexander the Great. Under the Macedonian monarchy the doctrines of Zoroaster appear to have been considerably corrupted by the introduction of foreign opinions, but they afterwards recovered their ascendancy. Zoroaster taught the existence of a supreme being, who created two other misty beings, and imparted to them as much of his own nature as seemed good to him. Of these, Ormzud, called by the Greeks Oromastides, remained faithful to his creator, and was regarded as the source of all good, while Arihman, Aramines, rebelled, and became the author of all evil upon the earth. Ormuzd created man and supplied him with all the materials of happiness, but Araman marred this happiness by introducing evil into the world, and creating savage beasts and poisonous reptiles and plants. In consequence of this, evil and good are now mingled together in every part of the world, and the followers of good and evil, the adherents of Ormuzd and Araman, carry on incessant war. But this state of things will not last for ever. The time will come when the adherents of Ormuzd shall everywhere be victorious, and Araman and his followers be consigned to darkness for ever. The religious rites of the ancient Persians were exceedingly simple. They used neither temples, altars, nor statues, and performed their sacrifices on the tops of mountains. They adored fire, light, and sun as the emblems of Ormuzd, the source of all light and purity, but did not regard them as independent deities. The religious rites and ceremonies were regulated by the priests, who were called magi. The learning of the Magi was connected with astrology and enchantment, in which they were so celebrated that their name was applied to all orders of magicians and enchanters. Wordsworth thus alludes to the worship of the Persians, The Persian, zealous to reject altar and image, and the inclusive walls and roofs of temples built by human hands, the loftiest heights ascending from their tops, with myrtle-wreathed tiara on his brows, presented sacrifice to moon and stars, and to the winds and mother elements, and the whole circle of heavens, for him a sensitive existence and a god. Excursion, Book 4. In Child Herald, Byron speaks thus of the Persian worship. Not vainly did the early Persian make his altar the high places, and the peak of earth or gazing mountains, and thus take a fit and unwalled temple, there to seek the spirit in whose honor shrines are weak. Upreared of human hands, come and compare columns and idol dwellings, goth or Greek, with nature's realms of worship, earth and air, nor fix on fond abodes to circumscribe thy prayer. 391. The religion of Zoroaster continued to flourish even after the introduction of Christianity, and in the third century was the dominant faith of the East, till the rise of the Mohammedan power and the conquest of Persia by the Arabs in the seventh century, who compelled the greater number of the Persians to renounce their ancient faith. 
those who refused to abandon the religion of their ancestors fled to the deserts of Kerman and to Hindustan, where they still exist under the name of Parsis, a name derived from Pars, the ancient name of Persia. The Arabs call them Gubers, from an Arabic word signifying unbelievers. At Bombay the Parsis are at this day a very active, intelligent, and wealthy class. For purity of life, honesty, and conciliatory manners, they are favorably distinguished. They have numerous temples to fire, which they adore as the symbol of the divinity. The Persian religion makes the subject of the finest tale in Moore's La Roque, the fire worshippers. The Guber chief says, Yes, I am of that impious race, those slaves of fire, that morn and even hail their creator's dwelling place among the living lights of heaven. Yes, I am of that outcast crew to Iran and to vengeance true, who curse the hour your Arabs came to desecrate our shines of flame and swear before God's burning eye to break our country's chains or die. Hindu Mythology The religion of the Hindus is professedly founded on the Vedas. To these books of their scripture they attach the greatest sanctity, and state that Brahma himself composed them at the creation. But the present arrangement of the Vedas is attributed to the sage Vyasa about five thousand years ago. The Vedas undoubtedly teach the belief of one supreme God, the name of this deity is Brahma. His attributes are represented by the three personified powers of creation, preservation, and destruction, which, under the respective names of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, form the Trimurti, or triad, of principal Hindu gods. Of the inferior gods, the most important are Indra, the god of heaven, of thunder, lightning, storm, and rain, Agni, the god of fire, Yama, the god of the infernal regions, Surya, the god of the sun. Brahma is the creator of the universe, and the source from which all the individual deities have sprung, and into which all will ultimately be absorbed. As milk changes to curd, and water to ice, so is Brahma variously transformed and diversified, without aid of exterior means of any sort. The human soul, according to the Vedas, is a portion of the supreme ruler, as a spark is of the fire. Vishnu Vishnu occupies the second place in the triad of the Hindus, and is the personification of the preserving principle. To protect the world in various epochs of danger, Vishnu descended to the earth in different incarnations, or bodily forms, which descents are called avatars. They are very numerous, but ten are more particularly specified. The first avatar was Matsya, the fish, under which form Vishnu preserved Manu, the ancestor of the human race, during a universal deluge. The second avatar was in the form of a tortoise, which form he assumed to support the earth, when the gods were churning the sea for the beverage of immortality, Amrita. We may omit the other avatars, which were of the same general character, that is, interpositions to protect the right or to punish wrongdoers, and come to the ninth, which is the most celebrated of the avatars of Vishnu, in which he appeared in the human form of Krishna, an invincible warrior, who by his exploits relieved the earth from the tyrants who oppressed it. Buddha is by the followers of the Brahmanical religion regarded as a delusive incarnation of Vishnu, assumed by him in order to induce the Asuras, opponents of the god, to abandon the sacred ordinances of the Vedas, by which means they lost their strength and supremacy. Kalki is the name of the tenth avatar, in which Vishnu will appear at the end of the present age of the world to destroy all vice and wickedness, and to restore mankind to virtue and purity. Shiva Shiva is the third person of the Hindu triad. He is the personification of the destroying principle. Though the third name, he is in respect to the number of his worshippers, and in the extension of his worship, before either of the others. In the Puranas, the scriptures of the modern Hindu religion, no allusion is made to the original power of this god as a destroyer, that power not being to be called into exercise till after the expiration of twelve millions of years, or when the universe will come to an end, and Mahadeva, another name for Shiva, is rather the representative of regeneration than of destruction. The worshippers of Vishnu and Shiva form two sects, each of which proclaims the superiority of its favorite deity, denying the claims of the other, and Brahma, the creator, having finished his work, seems to be regarded as no longer active, and has now only one temple in India, while Mahaveda and Vishnu have many. The worshippers of Vishnu are generally distinguished by a greater tenderness for life, 
and consequent abstinence from animal food, and a worship less cruel than that of the followers of Shiva. Juggernaut Whether the worshippers of Juggernaut are to be reckoned among the followers of Vishnu or Shiva, our authorities differ. The temple stands near the shore, about three hundred miles southwest of Calcutta. The idol is a carved block of wood, with a hideous face, painted black, and a distended, blood-red mouth. On festival days the throne of the image is placed on a tower sixty feet high, moving on wheels. Six long ropes are attached to the tower, by which the people draw it along. The priests and their attendants stand round the throne on the tower, and occasionally turn to the worshippers with songs and gestures. While the tower moves along, numbers of the devout worshippers throw themselves on the ground, in order to be crushed by the wheels, and the multitude shout in approbation of the act, as a pleasing sacrifice to the idol. Every year, particularly at two great festivals in March and July, pilgrims flock in crowds to the temple. Not less than seventy or eighty thousand people are said to visit the place on these occasions, when all castes eat together. Castes The division of the Hindus into classes or castes, with fixed occupations, existed from the earliest times. It is supposed by some to have been founded upon conquest, the first three castes being composed of a foreign race, who subdued the natives of the country and reduced them to an inferior caste. Others trace it to the fondness of perpetuating by descent from father to son certain offices or occupations. The Hindu tradition gives the following account of the origin of the various castes. At the creation, Brahma resolved to give the earth inhabitants who should be direct emanations from his own body. Accordingly, from his mouth came forth the eldest-born, Brahma, the priest, to whom he confided the four Vedas. From his right arm issued Shatira, the warrior, and from his left the warrior's wife. His thighs produced Vyasyas, male and female, agriculturalists and traders, and lastly, from his feet sprang Sudras, mechanics and laborers. The four sons of Brahma, so significantly brought into the world, became the fathers of the human race, and heads of their respective castes. They were commanded to regard the four Vedas as containing all the rules of their faith, and all that was necessary to guide them in their religious ceremonies. They were also commanded to take rank in the order of their birth, the Brahmins uppermost, as having sprung from the head of Brahma. A strong line of demarcation is drawn between the first three castes and the Sudras, the former are allowed to receive instruction from the Vedas, which is not permitted to the Sudras. The Brahmins possessed the privilege of teaching the Vedas, and were in former times in exclusive possession of all knowledge. Though the sovereign of the country was chosen from the Satriya class, also called Rajputs, the Brahmins possessed the real power, and were the royal counsellors, the judges, and magistrates of the country. Their persons and property were invaluable, and though they committed the greatest crimes, they could only be banished from the kingdom. They were to be treated by sovereigns with the greatest respect, for a Brahma, whether learned or ignorant, is a powerful divinity. When the Brahman arrives at years of maturity, it becomes his duty to marry. He ought to be supported by the contributions of the rich, and not to be obliged to gain his subsistence by any laborious or productive occupation. But as all the Brahmins could not be maintained by the working classes of the community, it was found necessary to allow them to engage in productive employments. We need say little of the two intermediate classes, whose rank and privileges may be readily inferred from their occupations. The Sudras, or fourth class, are bound to be servile attendants on the higher classes, especially the Brahmins, but they may follow mechanical occupations and practical arts, as painting and writing, or become traders or husbandmen. Consequently, they sometimes grow rich, and it will also sometimes happen that Brahmins become poor. That fact works its usual consequence, and rich sudras sometimes employ poor Brahmins in menial occupations. There is another class lower even than the sudras, for it is not one of the original pure classes, but springs from an unauthorized union of individuals of different castes. These are the pariahs, who are employed in the lowest services and treated with the utmost severity. They are compelled to do what no one else can do without pollution. They are not only considered unclean themselves, but they render unclean everything they touch. They are deprived of all civil rights, and stigmatized by particular laws regulating their mode of life, their houses, and their furniture. They are not allowed to visit the pagodas or temples of the other castes, but have their own pagodas and religious exercises. They are not suffered to enter the houses of the other castes. If it is done incautiously or from necessity, 
the place must be purified by religious ceremonies. They must not appear at public markets, and are confined to the use of particular wells, which they are obliged to surround with bones of animals, to warn others against using them. They dwell in miserable hovels, distant from cities and villages, and are under no restrictions in regard to food, which last is not a privilege, but a mark of ignominy, as if they were so degraded that nothing could pollute them. The three higher castes are prohibited entirely the use of flesh. The fourth is allowed to use all kinds except beef, but only the lowest case is allowed every kind of food without restriction. Buddha Buddha, whom the Vedas represent as a delusive incarnation of Vishnu, is said by his followers to have been a mortal sage, whose name was Gautama, called also by the complementary epithets of Sakyashina, the lion, and Buddha, the sage. By a comparison of the various epochs assigned to his birth, it is inferred that he lived about one thousand years before Christ. He was the son of a king, and when, in conformity to the usage of the country he was, a few days after his birth, presented before the altar of a deity, the image is said to have inclined its head as a presage of the future greatness of the new-born prophet. The child soon developed faculties of the first order, and became equally distinguished by the uncommon beauty of his person. No sooner had he grown to years of maturity than he began to reflect deeply on the depravity and misery of mankind, and he conceived the idea of retiring from society, and devoting himself to meditation. His father in vain opposed this design. Buddha escaped the vigilance of his guards, and having found a secure retreat, lived for six years undisturbed in his devout contemplations. At the expiration of that period he came forward at Benares as a religious teacher. At first some who heard him doubted of the soundness of his mind, but his doctrines soon gained credit, and were propagated so rapidly that Buddha himself lived to see them spread all over India. He died at the age of eighty years. The Buddhists reject entirely the authority of the Vedas, and the religious observances prescribed in them and kept by the Hindus. They also reject the distinction of case, and prohibit all bloody sacrifices, and allow animal food. Their priests are chosen from all classes. They are expected to procure their maintenance by perambulation and begging, and among other things it is their duty to endeavor to turn, to some use, things thrown aside as useless by others and to discover the medicinal power of plants. But in Ceylon three orders of priests are recognized. Those of the highest order are usually men of high birth and learning, and are supported at the principal temples, most of which have been richly endowed by the former monarchs of the country. For several centuries after the appearance of Buddha, his sect seems to have been tolerated by the Brahmins, and Buddhism appears to have penetrated the peninsula of Hindustan in every direction, and to have been carried to Ceylon and to the eastern peninsula. But afterwards it had to endure in India a long-continued persecution, which ultimately had the effect of entirely abolishing it in the country where it had originated, but to scatter it widely over adjacent countries. Buddhism appears to have been introduced into China about the year 65 of our era. From China it was subsequently extended to Korea, Japan, and Java. THE GRAND LAMA it is a doctrine alike of the Brahminical Hindus and of the Buddhist sect that the confinement of the human soul, an emanation of the divine spirit in a human body, is a state of misery, and the consequences of frailties and sins committed during former existences. But they hold that some individuals have appeared on this earth from time to time, not under the necessity of terrestrial existence, but who voluntarily descended to the earth to promote the welfare of mankind. These individuals have gradually assumed the character of reappearances of Buddha himself, in which capacity the line is continued till the present day, in the several lamas of Tibet, China, and other countries where Buddhism prevails. In consequence of the victories of Genghis Khan and his successors, the lama residing in Tibet was raised to the dignity of chief pontiff of the sect. A separate province was assigned to him as his own territory, and besides his spiritual dignity he became, to a limited extent, a temporal monarch. He is styled the Dalai Lama. The first Christian missionaries who proceeded to Tibet were surprised to find, there, in the heart of Asia, a pontifical court and several other ecclesiastical institutions resembling those of the Roman Catholic Church. They found convents for priests and nuns, also processions and forms of religious worship, attended with much pomp and splendor, and many were induced by these similarities to consider Lamaism as a sort of degenerated Christianity. 
It is not improbable that the Lamas derived some of these practices from the Nestorian Christians, who were settled in Tartary when Buddhism was introduced into Tibet. Prester John An early account, communicated probably by travelling merchants, of a Lama or spiritual chief among the Tartars, seems to have occasioned in Europe the report of a presbyter or Prester John, a Christian pontiff resident in Upper Asia. The Pope sent a mission in search of him, as did also Louis the Ninth of France, some years later, but both missions were unsuccessful, though the small communities of Nestorian Christians, which they did find, served to keep up the belief in Europe that such a personage did exist somewhere in the East. At last, in the fifteenth century, a Portuguese traveller, Pedro Covillam, happening to hear that there was a Christian prince in the country of the Abyssines, Abyssinia, not far from the Red Sea, concluded that this must be the true Prester John. He accordingly went thither, and penetrated to the court of the king, whom he calls Negus. Milton alludes to him in Paradise Lost, Book Eleven, where, describing Adam's vision of his descendants in their various nations and cities, scattered over the face of the earth, he says, Nor did his eyes not ken the empire of Negus to his utmost port, Ercoco, and the less maritime kings, Mombaza and Quilo and Melin. End of section 37LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Bullfinch's Mythology The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 38. Northern Mythology Valhalla the Valkyrie. Northern Mythology. The stories which have engaged our attention thus far relate to the mythology of southern regions. But there is another branch of ancient superstitions which ought not to be entirely overlooked, especially as it belongs to the nations from which we, through our English ancestors, derive our origin. It is that of the northern nations, called Scandinavians, who inhabited the countries now known as Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Iceland. These mythological records are contained in two collections, called the Eddas, of which the oldest is in poetry, and dates back to the year 1056. The more modern, or prose Edda, being of the date of 1640. According to the Eddas, there was once no heaven above, nor earth beneath, but only a bottomless deep, and a world of mist, in which flowed a fountain. Twelve rivers issued from this fountain, and when they had flowed far from their source, they froze into ice, and one layer accumulating over another, the great deep was filled up. Southward from the world of mist was the world of light. From this flowed a warm wind upon the ice and melted it. The vapours rose in the air and formed clouds, from which sprang Ymir, the frost giant, and his progeny, and the cow Audhumla, whose milk afforded nourishment and food to the giant. The cow got nourishment by licking the hoar frost and salt from the ice. While she was one day licking the salt stones, there appeared at first the hair of a man, on the second day the whole head, and on the third the entire form endowed with beauty, agility, and power. This new being was a god, from whom and his wife, a daughter of the giant race, sprang the three brothers, Odin, Vali, and V. They slew the giant Ymir and out of his body formed the earth, of his blood the seas, of his bones the mountains, of his hair the trees, of his skull the heavens, and of his brain clouds, charged with hail and snow. Of Ymir's eyebrows the gods formed Midgard, mid-earth, destined to become the abode of men. Odin then regulated the periods of day and night, and the seasons, by placing in the heavens the sun and moon, and appointing to them their respective courses. As soon as the sun began to shed its rays upon the earth, it caused the vegetable world to bud and sprout. Shortly after the gods had created the world, they walked by the side of the sea, pleased with their new work, but found that it was still incomplete, for it was without human beings. They therefore took an ash tree and made a man out of it, and they made a woman out of an elder, and called the man Ask and the woman Embla. Odin then gave them life and soul, vili reason and motion, 
and V bestowed upon them the senses, expressive features, and speech. Midgarth was then given them as their residence, and they became the progenitors of the human race. The mighty ash tree, Yggdrasil, was supposed to support the whole universe. It sprang from the body of Ymir, and had three immense roots, extending one into Asgard, the dwelling of the gods, the other into Jotunheim, the abode of the giants, and the third to Niflheim, the regions of darkness and cold. By the side of each of these roots is a spring, from which it is watered. The root that extends into Asgard is carefully tended by the three Norns, goddesses who are regarded as the dispensers of fate. They are Edur, the past, Verandi, the present, Skuld, the future. The spring at the Yotunem side is Ymir's well, in which wisdom and wit lie hidden, but that on Niflheim feeds the Adonidhog, darkness, which perpetually gnaws at the root. Four hearts run across the branches of the tree and bite the buds. They represent the four winds. Under the tree lies Ymir, and when he tries to shake off its weight, the earth quakes. Asgard is the name of the abode of the gods, access to which is only gained by crossing the bridge, Bifrost, the rainbow. Asgard consists of golden and silver palaces, the dwellings of the gods, but the most beautiful of these is Valhalla, the residence of Odin. When seated on his throne he overlooks all heaven and earth. Upon his shoulders are the ravens Hunin and Munin, who fly every day over the whole world, and on their return report to him all they have seen and heard. At his feet lie his two wolves, Jerry and Freki to whom Odin gives all the meat that is set before him, for he himself stands in no need of food. Mead is for him both food and drink. He invented the runic characters, and it is the business of the Norns to engrave the runes of fate upon a metal shield. From Odin's name, spelt Woden, as it sometimes is, came Wednesday, the name of the fourth day of the week. Odin is frequently called Alfadur, All-Father but this name is sometimes used in a way that shows that the Scandinavians had an idea of a deity superior to Odin, uncreated and eternal. Of the Joys of Valhalla Valhalla is the greatest hall of Odin, wherein he feasts with his chosen heroes, all those who have fallen bravely in battle, for all who die a peaceful death are excluded. The flesh of the boar, Shrimina, is served up to them, and is abundant for all. For although this boar is cooked every morning, he becomes whole again every night. For drink the heroes are supplied abundantly with mead from the she-goat, Hedrum. When the heroes are not feasting, they amuse themselves with fighting. Every day they ride out into the court, or field, and fight until they cut each other into pieces. This is their pastime. But when meal-time comes, they recover from their wounds and return to feast in Valhalla. THE VALKYRIE The Valkyrie are warlike virgins, mounted upon horses, and armed with helmets and spears. Odin, who is desirous to collect a great many heroes in Valhalla, to be able to meet the giants in a day when the final contest must come, sends down to every battlefield to make choice of those who shall be slain. The Valkyrie are his messengers, and their name means chosen of the slain. When they ride forth on their errand, their armour sheds a strange flickering light, which flashes up over the northern skies, making what men call the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. Footnote. Grey's Ode, The Fatal Sisters, is founded on this superstition. Of Thor and the Other Gods Thor, the Thunderer, Odin's eldest son, is the strongest of gods and men, and possesses three very precious things— the first is a hammer, which both the frost and the mountain giants know to their cost, when they see it hurled against them in the air, for it has split many a skull of their fathers and kindred. When thrown, it returns to his hand of its own accord. The second rare thing he possesses is called the belt of strength. When he girds it about him, his divine might is doubled. The third, also very precious, is his iron gloves, 
which he puts on whenever he would use his mallet efficiently. From Thor's name is derived our word Thursday. Frey is one of the most celebrated of the gods. He presides over rain and sunshine, and all the fruits of the earth. His sister Freya is the most propitious of the goddesses. She loves music, spring, and flowers, and is particularly fond of the elves, fairies. She is very fond of love ditties, and all lovers would do well to invoke her. Bragi is the god of poetry, and his song records the deeds of warriors. His wife, Iduna, keeps in a box the apples which the gods, when they feel old age approaching, have only to taste of to become young again. Heimdall is the watchman of the gods, and is therefore placed on the borders of heaven to prevent the giants from forcing their way over the bridge Bifrost, the rainbow. He requires less sleep than a bird, and sees by night as well as by day a hundred miles around him. So acute is his ear that no sound escapes him, for he can even hear the grass grow and the wool on a sheep's back. Of Loki and his progeny There is another deity who is described as the culminator of the gods, and the contriver of all fraud and mischief. His name is Loki. He is handsome and well made, but of a very fickle mood and most evil disposition. He is of the giant race, but forced himself into the company of the gods, and seems to take pleasure in bringing them into difficulties, and in extracting them out of the danger by his cunning, wit, and skill. Loki has three children. The first is the wolf Fenris, the second the Midgard serpent, the third Hela, death. The gods were not ignorant that these monsters were growing up, and that they would one day bring much evil upon gods and men. So Odin deemed it advisable to send one to bring them to him. When they came, he threw the serpent into that deep ocean by which the earth is surrounded. But the monster had grown to such an enormous size that holding his tail in his mouth, he encircles the whole earth. Hela he cast into Niflheim, and gave her power over nine worlds or regions into which she distributes those who are sent to her, that is, all who die of sickness or old age. Her hall is called Elvindana. Hunger is her table, starvation her knife, delay her man, slowness her maid, precipice her threshold, care her bed, and burning anguish forms the hangings of the apartments. She may easily be recognised, for her body is half flesh colour and half blue and she has a dreadfully stern and forbidding countenance. The wolf Fenris gave the gods a great deal of trouble before they succeeded in chaining him. He broke the strongest fetters as if they were made of cobwebs. Finally the gods sent a messenger to the mountain spirits, who made for them the chain called Glefner. It is fashioned of six things, viz. The noise made by the footfall of a cat, the beards of women, the roots of stones, the breath of fishes, the nerves, sensibilities, of bears, and the spittle of birds. When finished it was as smooth and soft as a silken string. But when the gods asked the wolf to suffer himself to be bound with this apparently slight ribbon, he suspected their design, fearing that it was made by enchantment. He therefore only consented to be bound with it, upon condition that one of the gods put his hand in his, Fenris's, mouth, as a pledge that the band was to be removed again. Tyr, the god of battles, alone had courage enough to do this. But when the wolf found that he could not break his fetters, and that the gods would not release him, he bit off Tyr's hand, and he has ever since remained one-handed. How Thor paid the mountain giant his wages. Once on a time, when the gods were constructing their abodes, and had already finished Midgard and Valhalla, a certain artificer came and offered to build them a residence, so well fortified that they should be perfectly safe from the incursions of the frost giants and the giants of the mountains. But he demanded for his reward the goddess Freya, together with the sun and moon. The gods yielded to his terms, provided he would finish the whole work himself without any one's assistance, and all within the space of one winter. But if anything remained unfinished on the first day of summer, he should forfeit the recompense agreed on. 
On being told these terms, the artificer stipulated that he should be allowed the use of his horse, Svaldalfari, and this, by the advice of Loki, was granted to him. He accordingly set to work on the first day of winter, and during the night let his horse draw stone for the building. The enormous size of the stone struck the gods with astonishment, and they saw clearly that the horse did one half more of the toilsome work than his master. Their bargain, however, had been concluded, and confirmed by solemn oaths, for without these precautions a giant would not have thought himself safe among the gods, especially when Thor should return from an expedition he had then undertaken against the evil demons. As the winter drew to a close, the building was far advanced, and the bulwarks were sufficiently high and massive to render the place impregnable. In short, when it wanted but three days to summer, the only part that remained to be finished was the gateway. Then sat the gods on their seats of justice, and entered into consultation, inquiring of one another who among them could have advised to give Freya away, or to plunge the heavens in darkness by permitting the giant to carry away the sun and the moon. They all agreed that no one but Loki, the author of so many evil deeds, could have given such bad counsel, and that he should be put to a cruel death, if he did not contrive some way to prevent the artificer from completing his task, and obtaining the stipulated recompense. They proceeded to lay hands on Loki, who in his fright promised upon oath that, let it cost him what it would, he would so manage matters that the man should lose his reward. That very night, when the man went with Svadilfari for building stone, a mare suddenly ran out of a forest and began to neigh. The horse thereat broke loose and ran after the mare into the forest, which obliged the man also to run after his horse, and thus between one and another the whole night was lost, so that at dawn the work had not made the usual progress. The man, seeing that he must fail of completing his task, resumed his own gigantic structure, and the gods now clearly perceived that it was in reality a mountain giant who had come amongst them. Feeling no longer bound by their oaths, they called on Thor, who immediately ran to their assistance, and lifting up his mallet, paid the workman his wages, not with the sun and moon, and not even by sending him back to Jotunheim, for which the first blow he shattered the giant's skull to pieces, and hurled him headlong into Niflheim. THE RECOVERY OF THE HAMMER Once upon a time it happened that Thor's hammer fell into the possession of the giant Thyrum, who buried it eight fathoms deep under the rocks of Jotunheim. Thor sent Loki to negotiate with Thyrum, but he could only prevail so far as to get the giant's promise to restore the weapon if Freya would consent to be his bride. Loki returned and reported the result of his mission. But the goddess of love was quite horrified at the idea of bestowing her charms on the king of the frost giants. In this emergency, Loki persuaded Thor to dress himself in Freya's clothes, and accompanied him to Jotunheim. Thyrum received his veiled bride with due courtesy, but was greatly surprised at seeing her eat for her supper eight salmons and a full-grown ox, besides other delicacies, washing the whole down with three tons of mead. Loki, however, assured him that she had not tasted anything for eight long nights, so great was her desire to see her lover, the renowned ruler of Jotunheim. Thyrum had, at a length, the curiosity to peep under his bride's veil, but started back in a fright, and demanded why Freya's eyeballs glistened with fire. Loki repeated the same excuse, and the giant was satisfied. He ordered the hammer to be brought in, and laid on the maiden's lap. Thereupon Thor threw off his disguise, grasped his redoubted weapon, and slaughtered Thyrim and all his followers. Frey also possessed a wonderful weapon, a sword, which would of itself spread a field with carnage whenever the owner desired it. Frey parted with this sword, but was less fortunate than Thor, and never recovered it. It happened in this way. Frey once mounted Odin's throne from whence one can see over the whole universe, and looking round saw far off in the giant's kingdom a beautiful maid, at the sight of whom he was struck with sudden sadness, insomuch that from the moment he could neither sleep, nor drink, nor speak, 
At last Gernier, his messenger, drew his secret from him, and undertook to get in the maiden for his bride, if he would give him his sword as a reward. Frey consented, and gave him the sword, and Skirnir set off on his journey, and obtained the maiden's promise, that within nine nights she would come to a certain place, and there wed Frey. Skirnir, having reported the success of his errand, Frey exclaimed, "'Long is one night, long are two nights, but how shall I hold out three? Shorter hath seemed a month to me, oft than of this longing time the half.' So Frey obtained Gerda, the most beautiful of all women, for his wife, but he lost his sword. This story, entitled Skirnir IV, and the one immediately preceding it, Thyrum's Quida, will be found poetically told in Longfellow's Poets and Poetry of Europe. End of chapter 38One day the god Thor, with his servant Thialfi, and accompanied by Loki, set out on a journey to the giant's country. Thialfi was of all men the swiftest of foot. He bore Thor's wallet, containing their provisions. When night came and they found themselves in an immense forest, and searched on all sides for a place where they might pass the night, and at last came to a very large hall, with an entrance that took the whole breadth of one end of the building. Here they lay down to sleep but towards midnight were alarmed by an earthquake which shook the whole edifice. Thor, rising up, called on his companions to seek with him a place of safety. On the right they found an adjoining chamber, into which the others entered, but Thor remained at the doorway with his mallet in his hand, prepared to defend himself, whatever might happen. A terrible groaning was heard during the night, and at dawn of day Thor went out and found lying nearer him a huge giant, who slept and snored in the way that had alarmed him so. It said that for once Thor was afraid to use his mallet, and as the giant soon waked up, Thor contented himself with simply asking his name. "'My name is Skirimir,' said the giant. "'But I need not ask thy name, for I know that thou art the god Thor. But what has become of my glove?' Thor then perceived that what they had taken overnight for a hall was the giant's glove, and the chamber where his two companions had sought refuge was the thumb. Skyrimir then proposed that they should travel in company, and Thor consenting, they sat down to eat their breakfast. And when they had done, Skyrimir packed all the provisions into one wallet, threw it over his shoulder, and strode on before them, taking such tremendous strides that they were hard to put it to keep up with him. So they traveled the whole day, and at dusk Skyrimir chose a place for them to pass the night in under a large oak tree. Skyrimir then told them he would lie down to sleep. "'But take ye the wallet,' he added." and prepare your supper. Skyrimir soon fell asleep and began to snore strongly, but when Thor tried to open the wallet, he found the giant had tied it up so tight he could not untie a single knot. At last Thor became wroth, and grasping his mallet with both hands, he struck a furious blow on the giant's head. Skyrimir, awakening, merely asked whether a leaf had fallen on his head, and whether they had supped and were ready to go to sleep. Thor answered that they were just going to sleep, and so saying went and laid himself down under another tree. But sleep came not that night to Thor, and when Skyrimir snored again so loud that the forest re-echoed with the noise, he arose, and grasping his mallet, launched it with such force that the giant's skull, that it made a deep dent in it. Skyrimir, awakening, cried out, "'What's the matter? Are there any birds perched on this tree? I felt some moss from the branches fall on my head. How fares it with thee, Thor?' But Thor went away hastily, saying that he had just then woke, and that as it was only midnight, there was still time for sleep. He, however, resolved that if he had an opportunity of striking a third blow, it should settle all matters between them. A little before daybreak he perceived that Skyrimir was again fast asleep, and a grin grasping his mallet, he dashed it with such violence that it forced its way into the giant's skull, up to the handle. But Skyrimir sat up, and stroking his cheek, said, An acorn fell on my head. 
What? Art thou awake, Thor? Methinks it is time for us to get up and dress ourselves. But you have not now a long way before you to the city called Utgard. I have heard you whispering to one another that I am not a man of small dimensions. But if you come to Utgard, you will see there many men much taller than I. Wherefore, I advise you, when you come there, not to make too much of yourselves. For the followers of Utgard, Loki will not brook the boasting of such little fellows as you are. You must take the road that leads eastward. Mine lies northward. So we must part here. Hereupon he threw his wallet over his shoulders and turned away from them into the forest, and Thor had no wish to stop him or to ask for any more of his company. Thor and his companions proceeded on their way, and towards noon descried a city standing in the middle of a plain. It was so lofty that they were obliged to bend their necks quite back on their shoulders in order to see the top of it. On arriving they entered the city, and seeing a large place before them with the door wide open, they went in, and found a number of men of prodigious stature, sitting on benches in the hall. Going further, they came before the king, Utgard Loki, whom they saluted with great respect. The king, regarding them with a scornful smile, said, If I do not mistake me, that stripling yonder must be the god Thor. Then addressing himself to Thor, he said, Perhaps thou mayest be more than thou appearest to be. What are the feats that thou and my fellows deem yourselves skilled in, for no one is permitted to remain here who does not, in some feat or another, excel all other men? The feat that I know, said Loki, is to eat quicker than any one else, and in this I am ready to give a proof against any one here who may choose to compete with me. That will indeed be a feat, said Utgard Loki, if thou performest what thou promised, it shall be tried forthwith. He then ordered one of his men who was sitting at the furthest end of the bench, and whose name was Logi, to come forward and try his skill with Loki. A trowel filled with meat having been set on the hall floor, Loki placed himself at one end, and Logi at the other, and each of them began to eat as fast as he could until they met in the middle of the trowel but it was found that Loki had only eaten the flesh, while his adversary had devoured both flesh and bone, and threw to the boot. All the company, therefore, have judged that Loki was vanquished. Utgard Loki then asked what feat the young man who accompanied Thor could perform. Thialfi answered that he would run a race with any one who might be matched against him. The king observed that skill in running was something to boast of, but if the youth would win the match he must display great agility. He then arose and went with all who were present to a plain where there was a good ground for running on, and calling a young man named Hugi, bade him to run a match with Thialfi. In the first course Hugi so much outstripped his competitor that he turned back and met him not far from the starting place. Then they ran a second and third time, but Thialfi met with no better success. Utgard Loki then asked Thor in what feats he would choose to give proofs of that prowess for which he was so famous. Thor answered that he would try a drinking match with anyone. Utgard Loki bade his cupbearer to bring the large horn which his followers were obliged to empty when they had trespassed in any way against the law of the feast. The cupbearer having presented it to Thor, Utgard Loki said, Whoever is a good drinker will empty that horn at a single draught, though most men make two of it, but the most puny drinker can do it in three. Thor looked at the horn, which seemed of no extraordinary size, though somewhat long. However, as he was very thirsty, he set it to his lips, and without drawing breath, pulled as long as deeply as he could, that he might not be obliged to make a second draught of it. But when he set the horn down and looked in, he could scarcely perceive that the liquor was diminished. After taking breath, Thor went to it again with all his might, but when he took the horn from his mouth it seemed to him that he had drunk rather less than before, although the horn could now be carried without spilling. "'How now, Thor?' said Utgard Loki. "'Thou must not spare thyself. If thou meanst to drain the horn at the third draught, thou must pull deeply.' and I must needs say that thou wilt not be called so mighty a man here as thou art at home, if thou showest no greater prowess in other feats than methinks will be shown in this. Thor, full of wrath, again set the horn to his lips, and did his best to empty it, but on looking he found the liquor was only a little lower, and so he resolved to make no further attempt, but gave back the horn to the cupbearer. I now see plainly, said Utgard Loki, that thou art not quite so stout as we thought thee, but wilt thou try any other feat, though methinks thou art not likely to bear any prize away with thee hence. "'What new trial hast thou to propose?' said Thor. "'We have a very trifling game here,' answered Utgard Loki, "'in which we exercise none but children. "'It consists in merely lifting my calf from the ground. "'Nor should I have dared to mention such a feat to the great Thor "'if I had not already observed that thou art by no means what we took thee for.' "'As he finished speaking, a large grey cat sprang on the hall floor. "'Thor put his hand under the cat's belly and did his utmost to raise him from the floor.' But the cat, bending his back, had notwithstanding all Thor's efforts, only one of his feet lifted up, seeing which Thor made no further attempt. 
This trial is turned out, said Utgard Loki, just as I imagined it would. The cat is large, but Thor is little in comparison to our men. Little as ye call me, answered Thor. Let me see who among you will come hither now I am in wrath and wrestle with me. I see no one here, said Utgard Loki, looking at the men sitting on the benches, who would not think it beneath him to wrestle with thee. Let somebody, however, call hither that old crone, my nurse Eli, and let Thor wrestle with her if he will. She has thrown to the ground many a man, not less strong than this Thor is. A toothless old woman then entered the hall, and was told by Utgard Loki to take hold of Thor. The tale is shortly told. The more Thor tightened his hold on the crone, the firmer she stood. At length, after a very violent struggle, Thor began to lose his footing, and was finally brought down upon one knee. Utgard Loki then told them to desist, adding that Thor had now no occasion to ask anyone else in the hall to wrestle with him, and it was also getting late. So he showed Thor and his companions to their seats, and they passed the night there in good cheer. The next morning, at the break of day, Thor and his companions dressed themselves and prepared for their departure. Utgard Loki ordered a table to be set for them, on which there was no lack of victuals or drink. After the repast, Utgard Loki led them to the gate of the city, and on parting asked Thor how he thought his journey had turned out, and whether he had met with any men stronger than himself. Thor told him that he could not deny, but that he had brought great shame on himself. And what grieves me most, he added, is that you will call me person of little worth. Nay, said Utgard Loki, it behooves me to tell thee the truth, now thou art out of the city, which so long as I live and have my way thou shalt never enter again. And by my troth had I known beforehand that thou hadst so much strength in thee, and thou would have brought me so near to a great mishap, I would have not have suffered thee to enter this time. Know then that I could have all along deceived thee by my illusions. First in the forest, where I tied up the wallet with great iron wire, so that thou could not untie it. After this thou gavest me three blows with thy mallet. The first, though the least, would have ended my days had it fallen on me, but I slipped aside and thy bows fell on the mountain, where thou wilt find three glens, one of them remarkably deep. These are the dents made by the mallet. I have made use of similar illusions in the contests you have had with my followers. In the first, Loki, like hunger itself, devoured all that was set before him. But Logi was in reality nothing else than fire, and therefore consumed not only the meat, but the trow that held it. Hugi, with whom Thialfi contended in running, was thought, and it is impossible for Thialfi to keep pace with that. When thou that in thy turn didst attempt to empty the horn, thou didst perform, by my troth, a deed so marvellous that I had not seen it myself, I should have never believed it. For one end of the horn reached the sea, which thou wast not aware of. But when thou comest to the shore, thou wilt perceive how much the sea has sunk by thy draughts. Thou didst perform a feat no less wonderful by lifting up the cat, and to tell thee the truth, when we saw that one of his paws was off the floor, we were all of us terror-stricken, for what thou tookest for a cat was in reality the Midgard serpent that encompassed the earth, and he was so stretched by thee, he was barely long enough to enclose it between his head and tail. Thy wrestling with Eli was a most astonishing feat, for there was never yet a man, nor will ever be, whom the old age, for such in fact was Eli, will not sooner or later lay low. But now, as we are going to part, let me tell thee that it would be better for both of us if thou never come near me again, for shouldst thou do so, I shall again defend myself by other illusions, so that thou wilt only lose thy labor, and get no fame from the contest with me. On hearing these words, Thor, in a rage, laid hold of his mallet, and would have launched it at him, but Utgard Loki has disappeared, and when Thor would have returned to the city to destroy it, he found nothing around him but a verdant plain. End of chapter 39《40 of Bullfinch's Mythology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bullfinch's Mythology The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 40 The Death of Baldur, The Elves, Runic Letters, Iceland, Teutonic Mythology, Nibelungen Lied. THE DEATH OF BALDOR Baldor the good, having been tormented with terrible dreams indicating that his life was in peril, told them to the assembled gods, who resolved to conjure all things to avert from him the threatened danger. Then Frigga, the wife of Odin, exacted an oath from fire and water, from iron and all other metals, from stones, trees, diseases, beasts, birds, poisons, and creeping things, 
that none of them would do any harm to Baldur. Odin, not satisfied with all this, and feeling alarmed for the fate of his son, determined to consult the prophetess Angerboda, a giantess, mother of Fenris, Hela, and the Midgard serpent. She was dead, and Odin was forced to seek her in Hela's dominions. This descent of Odin forms the subject of Grey's fine ode beginning, Uprose the king of men with speed, and saddled straight his coal-black steed. But the other gods, feeling that what Frigga had done was quite sufficient, amused themselves with using Baldor as a mark, some hurling darts at him, some stones, while others hewed at him with their swords and battle-axes, for do what they would, none of them could harm him. And this became a favorite pastime with them, and was regarded as an honor shown to Baldor. But when Loki beheld the scene he was sorely vexed that Baldor was not hurt. Assuming, therefore, the shape of a woman, he went to Fensalir, the mansion of Frigga, that goddess, when she saw the pretended woman, inquired of her if she knew what the gods were doing at their meetings. She replied that they were throwing darts and stones at Baldur, without being able to hurt him. Ay, said Frigga, neither stones nor sticks nor anything else can hurt Baldur. For I have exacted an oath from all of them. What? exclaimed the woman. Have all things sworn to spare Baldur? All things, replied Frigga, except one little shrub that grows on the eastern side of Valhalla and is called mistletoe, and which I thought too young and feeble to crave an oath from. As soon as Loki heard this, he went away, and resuming his natural shape, cut off the mistletoe, and repaired to the place where the gods were assembled. There he found Hodor standing apart, without partaking of the sports, on account of his blindness, and going up to him, said, Why dost thou not also throw something at Baldur? Because I am blind, answered Hodor, and see not where Baldur is, and have, moreover, nothing to throw. Come then, said Loki, do like the rest, and show honour to Baldur by throwing this twig at him, and I will direct thy arm towards the place where he stands. Hodor then took the mistletoe, and under the guidance of Loki darted it at Baldur, who, pierced through and through, fell down lifeless. Surely never was there witnessed, either among gods or men, a more atrocious deed than this. When Baldur fell, the gods were struck speechless with horror, and then they looked at each other, and all were of one mind to lay hands on him who had done the deed, but they were obliged to delay their vengeance out of respect for the sacred place where they were assembled. They gave vent to their grief by loud lamentations. When the gods came to themselves, Frigga asked who among them wished to gain all her love and good will. For this, said she, shall he have who will ride to hell and offer Hela a ransom, if she will let Baldur return to Asgard. Whereupon Hermod, surnamed the Nimble, the son of Odin, offered to undertake the journey. Odin's horse, Sleipnir, which has eight legs and can outrun the wind, was then led forth, on which Hermod mounted, and galloped away on his mission. For the space of nine days and as many nights he rode through deep glens so dark that he could not discern anything, until he arrived at the river Giol, which he passed over on a bridge covered with glittering gold. The maiden who kept the bridge asked him his name and lineage telling him that the day before five bands of dead persons had ridden over the bridge, and did not shake it as much as he alone. But, she added, thou hast not death's hue on thee. Why then ridest thou here on the way to hell? I ride to hell, answered Hermod, to seek Baldur. Hast thou perchance seen him pass this way? She replied, Baldur hath ridden over Giol's bridge, and yonder lieth the way he took to the abodes of death. Hermod pursued his journey until he came to the barred gates of hell. Here he alighted, girthed his saddle tighter, and, remounting, clapped both spurs to his horse, who cleared the gate by a tremendous leap without touching it. Hermod then rode on to the palace, where he found his brother Baldur occupying the most distinguished seat in the hall, and passed the night in his company. The next morning he besought Hela to let Baldur ride home with him, assuring her that nothing but lamentations were to be heard among the gods. Hela answered that it should now be tried whether Baldur was so beloved as he was said to be. If, therefore, she added, all things in the world, both living and lifeless, weep for him, then shall he return to life. But if any one thing speak against him or refuse to weep, he shall be kept in hell. Hermod wrote back to Asgard, and gave an account of all he had heard and witnessed. The gods upon this dispatched messengers throughout the world to beg everything to weep, in order that Baldur might be delivered from hell. All things very willingly complied with this request, both men and every other living being, 
as well as earths and stones and trees and metals, just as we have all seen these things weep when they were brought from a cold place into a hot one. As the messengers were returning, they found an old hag named Thokt sitting in a cavern, and begged her to weep Baldur out of hell. But she answered, Thokt will wail with dry tears Baldur's bale fire. Let Hela keep her own. It was strongly suspected that this hag was no other than Loki himself, who never ceased to work evil among gods and men. So Baldur was prevented from coming back to Asgard. The gods took up the dead body and bore it to the seashore where stood Baldur's ship, Ringham, which passed for the largest in the world. Baldur's dead body was put on the funeral pile, on board the ship, and his wife Nana was so struck with grief at the sight that she broke her heart, and her body was burned on the same pile as her husband's. There was a vast concourse of various kinds of people at Baldur's obsequies. First came Odin, accompanied by Frigga, the Valkyrie, and his ravens. Then Frey in his car drawn by Gulenbursti the boar. Heimdall rode his horse Goltop, and Freya drove in her chariot drawn by cats. There were also a great many frost giants, and giants of the mountain present. Baldur's horse was led to the pile, fully caparisoned, and consumed in the same flames with his master. But Loki did not escape his deserved punishment. When he saw how angry the gods were, he fled to the mountain, and there built himself a hut with four doors, so that he could see every approaching danger. He invented a net to catch the fishes, such as fishermen have used since his time. But Odin found out his hiding place, and the gods assembled to take him. He, seeing this, changed himself into a salmon, and lay hid among the stones of the brook. But the gods took his net, and dragged the brook, and Loki, finding he must be caught, tried to leap over the net. But Thor caught him by the tail, and compressed it, so that salmons ever since have had that part remarkably fine and thin. They bound him with chains, and suspended a serpent over his head, whose venom falls upon his face drop by drop. His wife, Saguna, sits by his side, and catches the drops as they fall, in a cup. But when she carries it away to empty it, the venom falls upon Loki, which makes him howl with horror, and twist his body about so violently that the whole earth shakes, and this produces what men call earthquakes. THE ELVES The Edda mentions another class of beings, inferior to the gods, but still possessed of great power. These were called elves. The white spirits, or elves of light, were exceedingly fair, more brilliant than the sun, and clad in garments of a delicate and transparent texture. They loved the light, were kindly disposed to mankind, and generally appeared as fair and lovely children. Their country was called Alfheim, and was the domain of Freyr, the god of the sun, in whose light they were always sporting. The black or night elves were a different kind of creatures. Ugly, long-nosed dwarfs of a dirty brown color, they appeared only at night, for they avoided the sun as their most deadly enemy, because whenever his beams fell upon any of them, they changed them immediately into stones. Their language was the echo of solitudes, and their dwelling places subterranean caves and clefts. They were supposed to have come into existence as maggots produced by the decaying flesh of Emir's body, and were afterwards endowed by the gods with a human form and a great understanding. They were particularly distinguished for a knowledge of the mysterious powers of nature, and for the runes which they carved and explained. They were the most skilful artificers of all created beings, and worked in metals and in wood. Among their most noted works were Thor's hammer and the ship Skidbladnir, which they gave to Freyr, and which was so large that it could contain all the deities with their war and household implements, but so skilfully was it wrought that when folded together it could be put into a side pocket. Ragnarok, the Twilight of the Gods It was a firm belief of the northern nations that a time would come when all the visible creation, the gods of Valhalla and Niflheim, the inhabitants of Jotunheim, Alfheim, and Midgard, together with their habitations, would be destroyed. The fearful day of destruction will not, however, be without its forerunners. First will come a triple winter, during which snow will fall from the four corners of the heavens, the frost will be very severe, the wind piercing, the weather tempestuous, and the sun impart no gladness. Three such winters will pass away without being tempered by a single summer. Three other similar winters will then follow, during which war and discord will spread over the universe. The earth itself will be frightened and begin to tremble. The sea leave its basin, the heavens tear asunder, and men perish in great numbers, 
and the eagles of the air feast upon their still quivering bodies. The wolf Fenris will now break his bands, the Midgard serpent rise out of her bed in the sea, and Loki, released from his bonds, will join the enemies of the gods. Amidst the general devastation, the sons of Muspelheim will rush forth under their leader Surtur, before and behind whom are flames and burning fire. Onward they ride over Bifrost, the rainbow bridge, which breaks under the horses' hoofs, but they, disregarding its fall, direct their course to the battlefield called Vigrid. Thither also repair the wolf Frenris, the Midgard serpent, Loki, with all the followers of Hela, and the frost giants. Heimdall now stands up and sounds the Gialar horn to assemble the gods and heroes for the contest. The gods advance, led on by Odin, who engages the wolf Fenris, but falls a victim to the monster, who is, however, slain by Vidar, Odin's son. Thor gains great renown by killing the Midgard serpent, but recoils and falls dead, suffocated with the venom which the dying monster vomits over him. Loki and Heimdall meet and fight till they are both slain. The gods and their enemies having fallen in battle, Surtur, who has killed Freyr, darts fire and flames over the world, and the whole universe is burned up. The sun becomes dim, the earth sinks into the ocean, the stars fall from heaven, and time is no more. After this, Alphadur, the Almighty, will cause a new heaven and a new earth to arise out of the sea. The new earth, filled with abundant supplies, will spontaneously produce its fruits without labor or care. Wickedness and misery will no more be known, but the gods and men will live happily together. Runic Letters One cannot travel far in Denmark, Norway, or Sweden without meeting with great stones of different forms, engraven with characters called runic, which appear at first sight very different from all we know. The letters consist almost invariably of straight lines, in the shape of little sticks either singly or put together. Such sticks were in early times used by the northern nations for the purpose of ascertaining future events. The sticks were shaken up, and from the figures that they formed a kind of divination was derived. The runic characters were of various kinds. They were chiefly used for magical purposes. The noxious, or as they called them, the bitter runes, were employed to bring various evils on their enemies. The favorable averted misfortune. Some were medicinal, others employed to win love, etc. In later times they were frequently used for inscriptions, of which more than a thousand have been found. The language is a dialect of the Gothic, called Norse, still in use in Iceland. The inscriptions may therefore be read with certainty, but hitherto very few have been found which throw the least light on history. They are mostly epitaphs on tombstones. Gray's Ode on the Descent of Odin contains an allusion to the use of runic letters for incantation. Facing to the northern clime, thrice he traced the runic rhyme, thrice pronounced in accents dread the thrilling verse that wakes the dead, till from out the hollow ground slowly breathed a sullen sound. The Skalds. The Skalds were the bards and poets of the nation a very important class of men in all communities in an early stage of civilization. They are the depositaries of whatever historic lore there is, and it is their office to mingle something of intellectual gratification with the rude feasts of the warriors, by rehearsing, with such accompaniments of poetry and music as their skill can afford, the exploits of their heroes, living or dead. The compositions of the skalds were called sagas, many of which have come down to us, and contain valuable materials of history, and a faithful picture of the state of society at the time to which they relate. Iceland. The Eddas and Sagas have come to us from Iceland. The following extract from Carlyle's lectures on heroes and hero-worship gives an animated account of the region where the strange stories we have been reading had their origin. Let the reader contrast it for a moment with Greece, the parent of classical mythology. In that strange island, Iceland, burst up, the geologists say, by fire from the bottom of the sea, a wild land of barrenness and lava, swallowed many months of every year in black tempests, yet with a wild, gleaming beauty in summer-time, towering up there stern and grim in the North Ocean, with its snow yokels, mountains, roaring geysers, boiling springs, sulphur pools, and horrid volcanic chasms, like the waste, chaotic battlefield of frost and fire, where, of all places, we least looked for literature or written memorials. The record of these things was written down. On the seabird of this wild land is a rim of grassy country, where cattle can subsist, and men, by means of them and of what the sea yields, and it seems they were poetic men, these, 
men who had deep thoughts in them and uttered musically their thoughts. Much would be lost had Iceland not been burst up from the sea, not been discovered by the Northmen. Teutonic Mythology In the mythology of Germany proper, the name of Odin appears as Wotan. Freya and Frigga are regarded as one and the same divinity, and the gods are in general represented as less warlike in character than those in the Scandinavian myths. As a whole, however, Teutonic mythology runs along almost identical lines with that of the northern nations. The most notable divergence is due to modifications of the legends by reason of the difference in climatic conditions. The more advanced social condition of the Germans is also apparent in their mythology. The Nibelungen Lied One of the oldest myths of the Teutonic race is found in the great national epic of the Nibelungen Lied which dates back to the prehistoric era when Wotan, Frigga, Thor, Loki, and the other gods and goddesses were worshipped in the German forests. The epic is divided into two parts, the first of which tells how Siegfried, the youngest of the kings of the Netherlands, went to Worms to ask in marriage the hand of Kriemhild, sister of Gunther, king of Burgundy. While he was staying with Gunther, Siegfried helped the Burgundian king to secure as his wife Brunhild, queen of Island. The latter had announced publicly that he only should be her husband, who could beat her in hurling a spear, throwing a huge stone, and in leaping. Siegfried, who possessed a cloak of invisibility, aided Gunther in these three contests, and Brunhild became his wife. In return for these services, Gunther gave Siegfried his sister, Kriemhild, in marriage. After some time had elapsed, Siegfried and Kriemhild went to visit Gunther, when the two women fell into a dispute about the relative merits of their husbands. Kriemhild, to exalt Siegfried, boasted that it was to the latter that Gunther owed his victories and his wife. Brunhild, in great anger, employed Hagen, liegeman of Gunther, to murder Siegfried. In the epic, Hagen is described as follows. Well-grown and well-compacted was that redoubted guest. Long were his legs and sinewy, and deep and broad his chest. His hair, that once was sable, with grey was dashed of late. Most terrible his visage, and lordly was his gait. Nibelungen Lied, stanza 1789. This Achilles of German romance stabbed Siegfried between the shoulders, as the unfortunate king of the Netherlands was stooping to drink from a brook during a hunting expedition. The second part of the epic relates how, thirteen years later, Kriemhild married Etzel, king of the Huns. After a time she invited the king of Burgundy, with Hagen and many others, to the court of her husband. A fearful quarrel was stirred up in the banquet hall, which ended in the slaughter of all of the Burgundians but Gunther and Hagen. These two were taken prisoners and given to Kriemhild, who with her own hand cut off the heads of both. For this bloody act of vengeance, Kriemhild was herself slain by Hildebrand, a magician and champion, who in German mythology holds a place to an extent corresponding to that of Nestor in the Greek mythology. The Nibelungen Horde this was a mythical mass of gold and precious stones which Siegfried obtained from the Nibelungs, the people of the north whom he had conquered and whose country he had made tributary to his own kingdom of the Netherlands. Upon his marriage, Siegfried gave the treasure to Kriemhild as her wedding portion. After the murder of Siegfried, Hagen seized it and buried it secretly beneath the Rhine at Lochum, intending to recover it at a future period. The hoard was lost forever when Hagen was killed by Kriemhild. Its wonders are thus set forth in the poem. "'Twas as much as twelve huge wagons in four whole nights and days could carry from the mountain down to the salt sea bay, though to and fro each wagon thrice journeyed every day. It was made up of nothing but precious stones and gold, were all the world brought from it, and down the value told, not a mark the less would there be left than erst there was, I ween. Nibelungen Lied, 19 Whoever possessed the Nibelungen hoard were termed Nibelungers. Thus, at one time, certain people of Norway were so called. When Siegfried held the treasure, he received the title King of the Nibelungers. Wagner's Nibelungen Ring Though Richard Wagner's music drama of the Nibelungen Ring bears some resemblance to the ancient German epic, it is a wholly independent composition, and was derived from various old songs and sagas, which the dramatists wove into one great harmonious story. The principal source was the Volsunga Saga, while lesser parts were taken from the Elder Edda and the Younger Edda, and others from the Nibelungen Lied, the Ecklin Lied, and other Teutonic folklore. 
In the drama there are at first only four distinct races, the gods, the giants, the dwarfs, and the nymphs. Later, by a special creation, there come the Valkyrie and the heroes. The gods are the noblest and highest race, and dwell first in the mountain meadows, later in the palace of Valhalla on the heights. The giants are a great and strong race, but lack wisdom. They hate what is noble and are enemies of the gods. They dwell in caves near the earth's surface. The dwarfs, or Nibelungs, are black, uncouth pygmies, hating the good, hating the gods. They are crafty and cunning, and dwell in the bowels of the earth. The nymphs are pure, innocent creatures of the water. The Valkyrie are daughters of the gods, but mingled with a mortal strain. They gather dead heroes from the battlefields and carry them to Valhalla. The heroes are children of the gods, but also mingled with a mortal strain. They are destined to become at last the highest race of all, and to succeed the gods in the government of the world. The principal gods are Wotan, Loki, Donner, and Fro. The chief giants are Fafner and Fasolt, brothers. The chief dwarfs are Alberic and Mime, brothers, and later Hagen, son of Alberic. The chief nymphs are the Rhine daughters, Flosshilda, Woglinda, and Welgunda. There are nine Valkyrie, of whom Brunhild is the leading one. Wagner's story of the ring may be summarized as follows. A hoard of gold exists in the depths of the Rhine, guarded by the innocent Rhine maidens. Alberic the dwarf forswears love to gain this gold. He makes it into a magic ring. It gives him all power, and he gathers by it a vast amount of treasures. Meanwhile, Wotan, chief of the gods, has engaged the giants to build for him a noble castle, Valhalla, from whence to rule the world, promising in payment Freya, goddess of youth and love. But the gods find they cannot spare Freya, as they are dependent on her for their immortal youth. Loki, called upon to provide a substitute, tells of Alberic's magic ring and other treasure. Wotan goes with Loki, and they steal the ring and the golden hoard from Alberic, who curses the ring and lays the curse on all who shall henceforth possess it. The gods give the ring and the treasure to the giants as a substitute for Freya. The curse at once begins. One giant, Fafner, kills his brother to get all, and transforms himself into a dragon to guard his wealth. The gods enter Valhalla over the Rainbow Bridge. This ends the first part of the drama, called the Rhinegold. The second part, the Valkyrie, relates how Wotan still covets the ring. He cannot take it himself, for he has given his word to the giants. He stands or falls by his word. So he devises an artifice to get the ring. He will get a hero race to work for him and recover the ring and the treasures. Sigmund and Sieglinda are twin children of this new race. Sieglinda is carried off as a child and is forced into marriage with Hunding. Sigmund comes and unknowingly breaks the law of marriage, but wins no thung, the great sword, and a bride. Brunhild, chief of the Valkyrie, is commissioned by Wotan, at the instance of Fricka, goddess of marriage, to slay him for his sin. She disobeys and tries to save him, but Hunding, helped by Wotan, slays him. Sieglinde, however, about to bear the free hero, to be called Siegfried, is saved by Brunhild and hid in the forest. Brunhild herself is punished by being made a mortal woman. She is left sleeping on the mountains with a wall of fire around her, which only a hero can penetrate. The drama continues with the story of Siegfried, which opens with a scene in the smithy between Mime the dwarf and Siegfried. Mime is welding a sword, and Siegfried scorns him. Mime tells him something of his mother, Sieglinde, and shows him the broken pieces of his father's sword. Wotan comes and tells Mime that only one who has no fear can remake the sword. Now Siegfried knows no fear, and soon remakes the sword no thung. Wotan and Alberic come to where the dragon Fafner is guarding the ring. They both long for it, but neither can take it. Soon Mime comes, bringing Siegfried with the mighty sword. Fafner comes out, but Siegfried slays him. Happening to touch his lips with the dragon's blood, he understands the language of the birds. They tell him of the ring. He goes and gets it. Siegfried now has possession of the ring, but it is to bring him nothing of happiness, only evil. It is to curse love and finally bring death. The birds also tell him of Mime's treachery. He slays Mime. He longs for someone to love. The birds tell him of the slumbering Brunhilde, whom he finds and marries. 
The dusk of the gods portrays at the opening the three norns, or fates, weaving and measuring the thread of destiny. It is the beginning of the end. The perfect pair, Siegfried and Brunhild, appear in all the glory of their life, splendid ideals of manhood and womanhood. But Siegfried goes out into the world to achieve deeds of prowess. He gives her the Nibelungen ring to keep as a pledge of his love till his return. Meanwhile, Alberich also has begotten a son, Hagen, to achieve for him the possession of the ring. He is partly of the Gibbachung race, and works through Gunther and Gutrun, half-brother and half-sister to him. They beguile Siegfried to them, give him a magic draught which makes him forget Brunhild, and fall in love with Gutrun. Under this same spell he offers to bring Brunhild for wife to Gunther. Now is Valhalla full of sorrow and despair. The gods fear the end. Lotan murmurs, Oh, that she would give back the ring to the Rhine. But Brunhild will not give it up. It is now her pledge of love. Siegfried comes, takes the ring, and Brunhild is now brought to the Rhine castle of the Gibbachungs. But Siegfried, under the spell, does not love her. She is to be wedded to Gunther. She rises in wrath and denounces Siegfried. But at a hunting banquet, Siegfried is given another magic draught remembers all, and is slain by Hagen by a blow in the back, as he calls on Brunhild's name in love. Then comes the end. The body of Siegfried is burned on a funeral pyre, a grand funeral march is heard, and Brunhild rides into the flames and sacrifices herself for love's sake. The ring goes back to the Rhine daughters, and the old world of the gods of Valhalla, of passion and sin, is burnt up with flames, for the gods have broken moral law and coveted power rather than love gold rather than truth, and therefore must perish. They pass, and a new era, the reign of love and truth, has begun. Those who wish to study the differences in the legends of the Nibelungen Lied and the Nibelungen Ring, and the way in which Wagner used his ancient material, are referred to Professor W. C. Sawyer's book on Teutonic Legends in the Nibelungen Lied and the Nibelungen Ring, where the matter is treated in full detail. For a very thorough and clear analysis of the ring as Wagner gives it, with a study of the musical motifs, probably nothing is better for general readers than the volume The Epic of Sounds by Frida Winworth. The more scholarly work of Professor Lavanac is indispensable for the student of Wagner's dramas. There is much illuminating comment on the sources and materials in Legends of the Wagner Drama by J. L. Weston. End of chapter 40《Chapter 41 of Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Patty Marie in Istanbul. Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 41 The Druids, Iona Druids The Druids were the priests or ministers of religion among the ancient Celtic nations in Gaul, Britain, and Germany. Our information respecting them is borrowed from notices in the Greek and Roman writers, compared with the remains of Welsh and Gaelic poetry still extant. The Druids combined the functions of the priest, the magistrate, the scholar, and the physician. They stood to the people of the Celtic tribes in a relation closely analogous to that in which the Brahmins of India, the Magi of Persia, and the priests of the Egyptians stood to the people respectively by whom they were revered. The Druids taught the existence of one god, to whom they gave a name, Baal, which Celtic antiquaries tell us means the life of everything, or the source of all beings, and which seems to have affinity with the Phoenician Baal. What renders this affinity more striking is that the Druids, as well as the Phoenicians, identified this, their supreme deity, with the sun fire was regarded as a symbol of the divinity. The Latin writers assert that the Druids also worshipped numerous inferior gods. 
They used no images to represent the object of their worship, nor did they meet in temples or buildings of any kind for the performance of their sacred rites. A circle of stones, each stone generally of vast size, enclosing an area of from twenty feet to thirty yards in diameter, constituted their sacred place. The most celebrated of those now remaining is Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, England. These sacred circles are generally situated near some stream or under the shadow of a grove or wide-spreading oak. In the center of the circle stood the cromlech or altar, which was a large stone placed in the manner of a table upon other stones set up on end. The Druids also had their high places, which were large stones or piles of stones on the summits of hills. These were called cairns, and were used in the worship of the deity under the symbol of the sun. That the Druids offered sacrifices to their deity, there can be no doubt but there is some uncertainty as to what they offered, and of the ceremonies connected with their religious services we know almost nothing. The classical Roman writers affirm that they offered on great occasions human sacrifices, as for success in war, or for the relief of dangerous diseases. Caesar has given a detailed account of the manner in which this was done. They have images of immense size, the limbs of which are framed with twisted twigs and filled with living persons. These being set on fire, those within are encompassed by the flames. Many attempts have been made by Celtic writers to shake the testimony of the Roman historians to this fact but without success. The Druids observed two festivals each year. The former took place in the beginning of May and was called Beltane, or Fire of God. On this occasion a large fire was kindled on some elevated spot in honor of the sun, whose returning beneficence they thus welcomed after the gloom and desolation of winter. Of this custom a trace remains in the name given to Whitsunday in parts of Scotland to this day. Sir Walter Scott uses the word in the boat song in The Lady of the Lake. Ours is no sapling, chance sown by the fountain, blooming at Beltane in winter to fade. The other great festival of the Druids was called Sawan, or Fire of Peace, and was held at Hollow Eve, 1st of November, which still retains this designation in the highlands of Scotland. On this occasion the Druids assembled in solemn conclave in the most central part of the district to discharge the judicial functions of their order. All questions, whether public or private, all crimes against person or property, were at this time brought before them for adjudication. With these judicial acts were combined certain superstitious usages, especially the kindling of the sacred fire, from which all the fires in the district, which had been beforehand scrupulously extinguished, might be relighted. This usage of kindling fires on Hollow Eve lingered in the British Islands long after the establishment of Christianity. Besides these two great festivals, the Druids were in the habit of observing the full moon, and especially the sixth day of the moon. On the latter they sought the mistletoe, which grew on their favorite oaks, and to which, as well as to the oak itself, they ascribed a peculiar virtue and sacredness. The discovery of it was an occasion of rejoicing and solemn worship. They call it, says Pliny, by a word in their language which means, Heal all, 
and having made a solemn preparation for feasting and sacrifice under the tree, they drive thither two milk-white bulls, whose horns are then for the first time bound. The priest then, robed in white, ascends the tree, and cuts off the mistletoe with a golden sickle. It is caught in a white mantle, after which they proceed to slay the victims, at the same time praying that God would render his gift prosperous to those to whom he had given it. They drink the water in which it has been infused, and think it a remedy for all diseases. The mistletoe is a parasitic plant, and it is not always nor often found on the oak, so that when it is found it is the more precious. The Druids were the teachers of morality as well as of religion. Of their ethical teaching a valuable specimen is preserved in the triads of the Welsh bards, and from this we may gather that their views of moral rectitude were on the whole just, and that they held and inculcated many very noble and valuable principles of conduct. They were also the men of science and learning of their age and people. Whether they were acquainted with letters or not has been disputed, though the probability is strong that they were to some extent. But it is certain that they committed none of their doctrine, their history, or their poetry to writing. Their teaching was oral, and their literature, if such a word may be used in such a case, was preserved solely by tradition. But the Roman writers admit that they paid much attention to the order and laws of nature, and investigated and taught to the youth under their charge many things concerning the stars and their motions, the size of the world and the lands, and concerning the might and power of the immortal gods. Their history consisted in traditional tales in which the heroic deeds of their forefathers were celebrated. These were apparently in verse, and thus constituted part of the poetry as well as the history of the Druids. In the poems of Ossian we have, if not the actual productions of Druidical times, what may be considered faithful representations of the songs of the bards. The bards were an essential part of the Druidical hierarchy. One author, Pennant, says, The bards were supposed to be endowed with powers equal to inspiration. They were the oral historians of all past transactions, public and private. They were also accomplished genealogists, etc. Pennant gives a minute account of the Eisteddfods, or sessions of the bards and minstrels, which were held in Wales for many centuries long after the Druidical priesthood in its other departments became extinct. At these meetings none but bards of merit were suffered to rehearse their pieces, and minstrels of skill to perform. Judges were appointed to decide on their respective abilities, and suitable degrees were conferred. In the earlier period the judges were appointed by the Welsh princes, and after the conquest of Wales, by commission from the kings of England. Yet the tradition is that Edward I, in revenge for the influence of the bards in animating the resistance of the people to his sway, persecuted them with great cruelty. This tradition has furnished the poet Gray with the subject of his celebrated ode, The Bard. There are still occasional meetings of the lovers of Welsh poetry and music held under the ancient name. Among Mrs. Heyman's poems is one written for an Eisteddfod, or meeting of Welsh bards, held in London, May 22, 1822. 
It begins with a description of the ancient meeting, of which the following lines are a part. Midst the eternal cliffs whose strength defied the crested Roman in his hour of pride, and where the druids' ancient Cromlech frowned, and the oaks breathed mysterious murmurs round, there thronged the inspired of yore on plain and height, in the sun's face beneath the eye of light, and bearing unto heaven each noble head, stood in the circle where none else might tread. The druidical system was at its height at the time of the Roman invasion under Julius Caesar. Against the druids, as their chief enemies, these conquerors of the world directed their unsparing fury. The druids, harassed at all points on the mainland, retreated to Anglesey and Iona, where for a season they found shelter and continued their now dishonored rites. The druids retained their predominance in Iona and over the adjacent islands and mainland until they were supplanted and their superstitions overturned by the arrival of St. Columba, the apostle of the highlands, by whom the inhabitants of that district were first led to profess Christianity. Iona one of the smallest of the British Isles, situated near a rugged and barren coast, surrounded by dangerous seas, and possessing no sources of internal wealth, Iona has obtained an imperishable place in history as the seat of civilization and religion at a time when the darkness of heathenism hung over almost the whole of northern Europe. Iona or Iconkil, is situated at the extremity of the island of Mull, from which it is separated by a strait of half a mile in breadth, its distance from the Scottish mainland being thirty-six miles. Columba was a native of Ireland and connected by birth with the princes of the land. Ireland was at that time a land of gospel light, while the western and northern parts of Scotland were still immersed in the darkness of heathenism. Columba, with twelve friends, landed on the island of Iona in the year of our Lord, 563, having made the passage in a wicker boat covered with hides. The Druids, who occupied the island, endeavored to prevent his settling there, and the savage nations of the adjoining shores incommoded him with their hostility, on several occasions endangering his life by their attacks. Yet, by his perseverance and zeal, he surmounted all opposition, procuring from the king a gift of the island, and establishing a monastery there, of which he was the abbot. He was unwearied in his labors to disseminate a knowledge of the scriptures throughout the highlands and islands of Scotland, and such was the reverence paid him that though not a bishop, but merely a presbyter and monk, the entire province with its bishops was subject to him and his successors. The Pictish monarch was so impressed with a sense of his wisdom and worth that he held him in the highest honor, and the neighboring chiefs and princes sought his counsel, and availed themselves of his judgment in settling their disputes. When Columba landed on Iona, he was attended by twelve followers, whom he had formed into a religious body of which he was the head. To these, as occasion required, others were from time to time added, so that the original number was always kept up. Their institution was called a monastery, and the superior an abbot, but the system had little in common with the monastic institutions of later times. The name by which those who submitted to the rule were known was that of Chaldees, probably from the Latin cultores dei, 
worshippers of God. They were a body of religious persons associated together for the purpose of aiding each other in the common work of preaching the gospel and teaching youth, as well as maintaining themselves in the fervor of devotion by united exercises of worship. On entering the order, certain vows were taken by the members, but they were not those which were usually imposed by monastic orders. For of these, which are three, celibacy, poverty, and obedience, the Chaldees were bound to none except the third. To poverty they did not bind themselves. On the contrary, they seem to have labored diligently to procure for themselves and those dependent on them the comforts of life. Marriage was also allowed them, and most of them seemed to have entered that state. True, their wives were not permitted to reside with them at the institution, but they had a residence assigned to them in an adjacent locality. Near Iona there is an island which still bears the name of Island Namban, Women's Island, where their husbands seem to have resided with them, except when duty required their presence in the school or the sanctuary. Campbell, in his poem of Reulura, alludes to the married monks of Iona. The pure Chaldees were Alban's earliest priests of God, ere yet an island of her seas by foot of Saxon monk was trod, long ere her churchmen by bigotry were barred from holy wedlock's tie. Twas then that E famed afar, in Iona preached the word with power, and Reulura, beauty's star, was the partner of his bower. In one of his Irish melodies, Moore gives the legend of St. Sananus and the lady who sought shelter on the island, but was repulsed. O oh, haste and leave this sacred isle, unholy bark, ere morning smile, for on thy deck, though dark it be, a female form I see, and I have sworn this sainted sod shall ne'er by woman's foot be trod. In these respects, and in others, the Chaldees departed from the established rules of the Romish Church, and consequently were deemed heretical. The consequence was that as the power of the latter advanced, that of the Chaldees was enfeebled. It was not, however, until the thirteenth century that the communities of the Chaldees were suppressed and the members dispersed. They still continued to labor as individuals and resisted the inroads of papal usurpation as best they might till the light of the Reformation dawned on the world. Iona, from its position in the western seas, was exposed to the assaults of the Norwegian and Danish rovers by whom those seas were infested, and by them it was repeatedly pillaged, its dwellings burnt, and its peaceful inhabitants put to the sword. These unfavorable circumstances led to its gradual decline, which was expedited by the subversion of the Chaldees throughout Scotland. Under the reign of Popery, the island became the seat of a nunnery, the ruins of which are still seen. At the Reformation, the nuns were allowed to remain, living in community, when the abbey was dismantled. Iona is now chiefly resorted to by travelers on account of the numerous ecclesiastical and sepulchral remains that are found upon it. The principal of these is the cathedral or abbey church and the chapel of the nunnery. Besides these remains of ecclesiastical antiquity, there are some of an earlier date and pointing to the existence on the island of forms of worship and belief different from those of Christianity. These are the circular cairns 
which are found in various parts and which seem to have been of druidical origin. It is in reference to these remains of ancient religion that Johnson exclaims, That man is little to be envied whose patriotism would not gain force upon the plains of Marathon, or whose piety would not grow warmer amid the ruins of Iona. In The Lord of the Isles, Scott beautifully contrasts the church on Iona with the cave of Staffa opposite. Nature herself, it seemed, would raise a minister to her maker's praise, nor for a meaner use ascend her columns or her arches bend, nor of a theme less solemn tells that mighty surge that ebbs and swells, and still between each awful pause from the high vault an answer draws, in varied tone prolonged and high, that mocks the organ's melody. Nor doth its entrance front in vain to old Iona's holy fane, that nature's voice might seem to say, Well hast thou done, frail child of clay, Thy humble powers that stately shrine tasked high and hard, but witness mine. End of Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch